Okay, so what we're gonna tie is the green rockworm. But the difference with this type of fly or this style of fly or these family of flies, okay, this fly is from a family of flies that are called pertigons, okay? And pertigon is a Spanish word for shot or pellet, okay? And these things have come out of the world of competition fly fishing. And a lot of these patterns uh, in particular were designed and used very successfully by the Spanish fly fishing team. Now, we're all familiar with the Czech nymph, okay? That basically got this whole thing started on high sticking and flies that are hydrodynamic and stuff like that. They will plummet and get down into the strike zone when you're high sticking and stuff. This fly, I would like to say, I refer to it as, as a second generation Czech nymph, okay? So what you'll notice about it, it ha has going for it, it's on a 60 degree, here, you can see it better now. It's on a 60 degree jig hook. It's got a very small tungsten bead, which you can change depending on conditions. I typically will tie these flies 14, 16, 18, and usually 16 is my go-to. Uh, it's very simplistic but it's extremely effective. With the tungsten bead and the inverted hookup presentation, the body now has been made perfectly smooth with UV uh, resin, okay? Reduces drag in the water, makes the fly very hydrodynamic. I use this exclusively as a dropper like underneath, and this, this fly is so little and I wish I could show you a picture of how damn small this is, but I don't have the pictures anymore because they're all gone. Uh, and I showed you guys earlier on. It's like Put the your size... finger next to it. What's that? Yeah, the size of a dime. I mean, it's really, really. There's my fingernail. This there thing is really little. Okay. So you can float this thing under a caddis. You could float this thing under a Goddard. You could float this thing probably under a stimulator hippie stump. But what's cool about it and what it does and what makes it so unique is if you use the right tippet off the back of your indicator fly, this I'm fishing this fly as my primary target. The indicator is just a second deal. You know, if I get, so how many of us have been fishing and a fish will come up and hit your indicator or your dough ball or your little, whatever you got up there. And you're like, shit, if there was a fly there, I'd have caught that fish. So mm -hmm. to me, this is the target. And when I'm fishing that way, and there's not a lot of serious topwater activity, I'm concentrating on making sure that my leader length is correct. And I'm getting down into the strike zone. As you know, drifting and moving water, your target area is, it, it isn't very long, even though, and plus what you see on top is not what's really happening on the bottom. So to mitigate that to a degree, these types of flies have been designed and I'm experimenting with them more and more and more. This one I like. Uh, there are flies that you can tie. I'm working on some pheasant tail variations and stuff on this. And what's important for you to remember if you start playing with this stuff is it's designed with the body being coated to reduce any drag in the water. Okay, that's important. And then you can put a bead size up or a bead size down, depending on your desire to get this thing down to wherever you need it to go. When you're doing tails, don't put anything on like a pheasant tail. Use some Coq de Leon or use some Fibets or something that are more hydrodynamic, okay? That's very important. So with all that being said, what we'll do is uh, we'll get started and we'll tie one. Does anybody have any questions real quick right now before I start? Yeah, Mark, where, where do you get that hook with the um, 
by the bead where it's the, the, okay. 60 degrees. Where do you get those? Well, here's what I've got, and, and they're very readily available. Okay, so let me switch this over and I'll show you all this stuff. Okay, so this is this is this is one of the hooks that I use. Uh, it's a TMC. Boy, this this light on here is really awful. That looks good, Mark. It's a 400 BL competition grade. But what's different about this, if you notice, you see the bend there, it's kind of short. So the, another fly or another hook that I like, it's still a 16 and it's still, uh, wow, this is really, oh, there we go. Okay. But you notice that the arm on the bend is a little bit longer and it's a little softer bend. For some reason, I get better results with this hook. Okay, and this is a Gamo J2016, great hook. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna tie this on. Okay, now the beads, my standard go-to bead, these are sold by Hairline. It's a, I'm gonna have to tape that up there, okay? Tungsten bead, 330 seconds, slotted black. As far as thread goes, Viva Sixot. Why is it backwards? Or is it is it straight reading to you guys? It's straight backwards. It's straight reading to me. Okay, it's backwards to me then. Okay, so that's what I'm using for the body. Uh, for the collar, just behind the bead, I'm using Benici 10 knot. I tie this a lot because I just love it. I mean, it's nice and flat. If you look at the denier on this thing, like 120, it's stupid that thread this small can be this strong. I use it all the time. And then uh, to for a rib, any kind of monofilament tippet will work. For some reason, this just seems to work good for me. Uh, they claim it's 14 pound, but the diameter is more important. So it's 10 thousandths. That works really well. And you can play with that because if you put too much, then it doesn't look good. If you put not enough, then it just kind of gets lost in the UV. So food for thought. Now, as far as the UV clear, I love this stuff. I use it all the time. Thin, hard formula, Solaris. Good stuff. Dries hard, no tack, great stuff. They also make the same product and it's called bone dry, okay? It comes in a little bottle with a brush and I use this for finishing heads and stuff. This stuff is awesome. So there you go, okay? So there's, there's the two cements that I use. All the flies we're tying tonight, both of them will be done in clear cure. So, uh, I use a pair of bead tweezers like Dan did. Okay, a little dent in there holds the bead. My fingers aren't super nimble. Uh, these hooks are really teeny. So sometimes that's a problem. So I'm gonna switch this back over and get started here. <clears throat> and this shouldn't take too long. This will go pretty quick. Okay, so let me get going here. Get rid of this. Oh, I got to put my glasses on so I can see. Holy crap. There we go. All right. No, B here they are. <coughs> there you go. 
Yeah, these bead pliers are game savers sometimes because you just can't find any way to hold that, especially when you're doing stuff this small. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this so you guys can see it, but there's my bead. <laughs> Here's my little teeny hook. And basically just run it through. And then put it in the vise. So this is not a hard fly to tie. Okay, is that in focus? Yeah, that's good. Okay, so got our hook, got our bead. Oh, get in there. All right. Make sure your bead's setting on there correctly. Okay, we're going to just get a little bit of thread. We're going to make a thread base with touching wraps. So basically, I'm just going to go, I usually go about halfway and I cut the tag off so I don't get a frayed edge. Get rid of that. And I will go down the bend a little bit. Boy, I don't know if that blows you guys out, does it? No, that's not bad. I can, now I can see. It's looking good, Mark. Down the bend a little. There we go. All right. What's important, touching wraps. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know this. For those of you who don't know this, every time you make one turn around the hook, you put a half a turn of twist in your thread. So you can imagine it won't take long to bind that stuff completely up if you're not laying flat, flat thread wraps. And that's going to be hugely important when we tie the winter worm because we're going to be using big, fat thread to create an underbody. And if you don't have that unity in there, then, okay, so I come back and I stop. I cut off a little piece of monofilament, whatever size you want, four, five, six inches, whatever's easy to manage, okay? Now this might be being a little anal, but that's me. You guys have known me all long enough that I'm A++. So. Instead of tying this in as flat monofilament, I'm going to take my pliers and I'll show you what they look like. I mean, I'm sure everybody has a pair, but just a pair of, you know, flat pliers. And what I'm going to do is I am going to flatten this monofilament about as long as the shank. And what that'll do is give me a nice flat tie-in. And it will give me a little bit more surface area and it should hold better, not that it would come out anyway. So, go back to the thing here. It should be all right. There we go. Okay, so. I like to put this on the near side. That's just how I tie. You can put it on the top or on the bottom. It doesn't really matter. Okay, and ideally it's nice if that ends, the part that you did that was flat, that ends before you get to the end of your thread body. Now I'm trying to be very careful to do touching wraps because this basically is my body. This is the fly. And if I have gaps and stuff, then that's going to show up. Although the UV is fairly forgiving. They also now make UV in multiple colors. You notice I put my finger on there. I'm on, I'm on twisting my thread. I'm just trying to flatten it. So it'll just give me a little nicer lay down. There we go. Get past that one spot. Give it another twist. Remember, Mark, because you've got the magnifying microscope on there. Yeah. It shows everything until you just put the fly in your hand and then you can't see it. I, I okay. What was that noise? Okay, now I'm gonna come up here hmm? and I'm gonna whip finish this and take it off. So I usually just do two. 
up by the bead, grab my bodkin, which I use, and then I always give it a little tug to set it and then lance it. It gives me a cleaner cut. Okay, so there we go. That's the body, the body's done. So that was pretty simple. Now you get your other bobbin. Hopefully you guys have multiple bobbins by now. I'd be disappointed if you didn't. And we're gonna take our black thread. 6-0 will be fine. That's kind of big. 8-0 would be better. If you have something smaller, all the better. I use this 10-0 Benici because I really like it. And what I'm gonna do is just make a little teeny thread base here, which is basically my head that will kind of complement the bead. And this is where I will then tie off my monofilament. So I usually go around the body, away from me, towards me in open spirals because you wanna create that segmentation. And then when you put the UV on, it really looks good. And then I'll do one more up here by the bead. And I like to kind of finish on top. Two wraps behind, two wraps in front, which hold the ones in back down. And then I'll do a couple more in front and then cut this off as close as I possibly can with my small tip scissors. And then make a nice flat thread head after I flatten my thread and just smooth that out a little bit because this is all oh that's not supposed to happen look at that what just happened there? okay is that gonna work that'll work so i can just go that's gone huh see that that isn't supposed to happen and it's happening okay so that is just How's that? Is that better? There we go. Okay, yep. so I've got a little thread bump there. All right. So I'll do three or four whip finishes on here to smooth this out. There we go. Snug that. And then just give it a little snip. Okay, so, so far, we've got, and you can see the monofilament very clearly. So what's going to be important here, guys, is that when we coat this thing, we don't want to coat the living heck out of it because we're going to lose that segmentation. So really, all you want to do is just put a skin coat on. Okay, very, very, very thin. That's why I use thin cement. And what I'm gonna do is just put a little dollop on, on a card, piece of cardboard, and I'm gonna put it on with my bodkin and, and kind of smooth it around and then hit it with my light. So you just need just a little bit, just a little dot, just really, really small. And again, a little goes a real long way. You just don't need a ton here. And you can start anywhere you want. I usually start behind the bead to kind of fill in that gap. And you'll see it start to take shape. And then what I'll do is I'll just put like between the rib and then run my bodkin over so I can still maintain that, that that, that integrity there. I, I don't want it to be bulky. I don't want it to look like super smooth. I want that rib to show. And this thing is virtually bulletproof. The worst thing you could do to it would be like stick it in a tree, obviously, stick it in a log, get it stuck in a rock. Other than that, I mean, this thing is bulletproof. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, how's that look? I got to look at it on the camera. 
see if I missed a spot. That looks that looks pretty good. Okay. So let's blast it with the torch. Set this stuff. And as you can tell, it fluoresces just a little. <coughs> But again, this thing is great. It's, it has very little resistance in the water. Everything is smooth. There isn't a lot of bulk there. There's nothing that's gonna grab water and create any kind of resistance. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna put just a little drop on the bottom here. I just don't like that that's too flat. That looks better, doesn't it? I think it does. Okay. So there it is. The tungsten bead. Jig hook. Pretty gone. Style. Rockworm.